This conference is brought to you by CallStack, a total software engineering consultancy. Make some noise for Monica. I love that energy. Welcome, Monica. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope that you enjoyed your coffee break. I'm not a coffee person myself, but I heard really good things about the ones that you're getting served here. Uh, so I hope it just gets you through what is left and through tomorrow and everything. I don't know how it works. Um, I have had the opportunity to participate two times in this conference, uh, both of them remotely. And while it has and it was a great experience, um, I am really happy to be here finally in person, even if it means that I won't be able to re-record if everything goes wrong. But that's okay. Um, today I'm going to take you on a close um, tour uh, of, to a dear project of us at Shopify. It is the Black Friday Cyber Monday uh, Globe, which I'm going to be referring to as the BFCM Globe. And every year for Black Friday Cyber Monday, uh, we have an engineered team put together a visualization in real time of purchases made through Shopify powered mer uh, merchants worldwide. Uh, this is what we call the BFCM Globe. Last year's version of the Globe was one that we are really proud of uh, and that really, really raised the bar for what is coming next. So today I wanted to take uh, the opportunity to share some details of how we got to build the Globe last year um, under the light of creating web applications uh, that are also cross-platform uh, built using React and related libraries. So let me give you a brief overview of um, my talk today. I decided to divide it in three, um, I guess, sections, and then a, fi a final thoughts one. The first one uh, being an introduction, uh, introduction to what the globe means for us and why we do it, and maybe just like, get us into the details of the layers that compose the, um, the globe. Then uh, a little bit of a deeper dive into the technical aspects of it. And then maybe just talk about a couple of challenges that we have and that we have to take into account when thinking of uh, cross-platform. And then just the final thoughts. OK, uh, so Black Friday and Cyber Monday is perhaps one of the biggest events in the year for Shopify. As many of you might have already know, uh, Shopify missions is to power billions of merchants uh, to sell products and services online. We work during the year to deliver the best features, and uh, so everything goes smoothly for merchants and buyers. So BFCM is like uh, our opportunity to kind of see the product of our work during the year, and also and kind of on asteroids because, as you already know, there is a, a, a lot of like buying and selling this time. We care a lot about the BFCM Globe because it showcases the success of merchants and their products, and also allows us to see the impact of what we do um, at a global scale. So for last year's version of it, we put a lot into it. We wanted to go better on the visuals and focus a lot on performance. We ended up implementing and optimizing 3D visuals and animations uh, using libraries such as 3.js and React Tree Fiber. Obviously, and this is a disclaimer I want to do, uh, make, I'm going to be mentioning these two particular libraries just because they were the ones uh, that suited more our needs for the project. But they are not the only ones. And you know, uh, I'm pretty sure you can do great things with the existing ones as well. OK, so uh, to start transitioning into the technical details of the globe, uh, this is like obviously an outside the web version of the globe that we had for last year's um, BFCM. Um, and it has had a series of layers that made it what it was. So the, one of them uh, is the arcs, the ones that you can see obviously just going around all over the place, which were used to represent an order, order leaving the merchant's location and going to the um, buyer's address. Then we also have the city dots, which are just the yellow ones that are all over there, um, that were used to represent specific cities where orders were placed within 24 hours. We also have uh, some fireworks, uh, which, well, they were just meant to be festive and to celebrate uh, a merchant's first purchase during the day. There was another uh, layer of the globe that you probably can see here, um, which is the 
camera feature, a camera animation, which basically was meant to transport the viewer from one city to another one in an immersive way. So it wasn't just like jumping from one to, a, you know, from whatever you were to another side um, in a random way. You will see, uh, I'll talk about it a little bit more uh, as we go. Then we also have the airplanes, which are those little ones that you see flying here and there. Uh, an additional cool feature that we make, uh, you know, that we decided to implement to, uh, to make things a little bit more uh, realistic and also fun. And obviously, that is the globe, which is like the biggest thing that you see there, and is, it is uh, self-explanatory. OK, so handling, to jump into the technical aspects of this, um, handling a global data set with thousands of real-time transactions meant for us that our architecture had to be both robust and scalable. We organized our glove into the layers that I just mentioned, each responsible for a different aspect of the visualization. So to start with the arcs, as I mentioned before, they were meant to represent a transaction. Using, uh, we used curves, uh, baser curves, to be more precise, with control points calculated dynamically. Uh, this allowed us to animate the arcs in real time, showing orders as they were happening. Uh, as I would say, they were modeled as baser curves uh, that used four points. The first one being uh, the starting point of the curve, the second one will be located at the 25th uh, percent of it, then the 75, and then just uh, P3 located at the end, which allows us to have control of the height of the arc. To render these arcs, we created a mesh composed of a strip of triangles along the curve, allowing us to control thickness and apply shaders for style. However, uh, the mesh would disappear from certain angles, depending on where you were looking at it. So we used the cross product of the tangent vector and the camera direction to ensure the mesh always uh, was facing the viewer. So these red lines that you see in this arc representation are what the tangent are, and they uh, were the ones creating a new vector every time. For texturing, the UV coordinates of the mesh were set with the V coordinate ranging from 0 to 1 to the end, with intermediate points having corresponding values. So as new orders were coming in, uh, these arc meshes could be cre uh, created and added to the glove. Uh, they would each have their own start time attribute, and then as the U time value would increase uh, each frame, all the arcs would animate independently. Okay, another feature that we had in the glove uh, last year was the glowing dots. They were uh, meant to represent the places where orders were placed in the past 24 hours. We debated whether to use meshes, as, it, uh, as we were just doing with the arcs, aligned to the surface, or to use particles that always face the camera. We, uh, the, the difference, as you can see, is very subtle, but um, we chose instance particles with GL points, since they led to a nicer glow, and it looked just a little bit cooler. So you can see this one is the one we ended up going uh, on your right. The one we ended up going with, uh, that it just looks a little bit more shiny, that was the first iteration that we attempted to do. OK, another feature that we have uh, was the fireworks, personally one of the favorite ones for me. Uh, we wanted to use them to celebrate the first sales of our merchants, um, and so we did. Similar to our arcs, we wanted to see if all of the of fireworks could be done in a single draw call, this to facilitate uh, rendering performance. So uh, we generated the base mesh by using 3JS's um, geometry function that you can see there, and it's also unpronounceable, uh, and connecting triangle strips from center to each uh, to the vertex. Then, uh, as the second, like following steps, uh, we gradually lowered verti uh, the vertices along each of the trail to simulate the, the gravity. So that's the first image there. And then we use the UVS on each trail to treat it the same way we were doing with the arcs, um, with V starting at zero and then uh, going all the way towards the, way, the end uh, for one. And then finally, to give it the blurry touch at the end, over time, we use a noise effect that is also provided by uh, the library. And this is the uh, 3JS. OK. Uh, so this is the camera effect uh, that I was talking about, camera animation. Um, is one of the coolest features that I think we implemented. Um, and then 
this was the way the camera would move from one place to another when the viewer would search for a city. So if you were in New York and you wanted to search for what's happening, I don't know, in Medellin, for instance, Colombia, whatever, uh, you will just type it in the search and then the camera will just immersively take you there instead of like jumping from one point to the other one. We can see here uh, the camera, the view from the camera perspective. I'm sorry, looking at the camera. Uh, but for the viewer, it will be more from you know, like first uh, person type of view. Um, the simplest way that we thought that, that you could imagine how the, this feature was implemented is these three e easy steps. Uh, the first one is to convert the 3D starting point of the camera into spherical coordinates. Second one, to convert the 3D end point of the camera into spherical coordinates. And then at the end, just inter interpolate between the start and the end points over time. For this specific feature of the globe, um, the look at function ensures the camera focuses on the desired city and slightly offsets the uh, pi angle frames from the city with the horizon. However, we did experience a problem when implementing this the first time. Uh, traveling to cities like Sydney caused the world to flip upside down, as you can see here, uh, due to the camera's app property. So, you can see here that like, the transition between New, uh, New York and London, for instance, was normal, at least to the eye, but then Sydney will be a little funky. The fix to this was to set, up, to set the app property uh, to each frame using the uh, pi and theta values. These adjustments ensure that smooth camera transitions are made through cities. And the second advantage of this slide, um, animated pins. So these are obviously the pins that you can see there. One of the things that we wanted to focus on this year was, uh, and I guess last year, was showing insights from each city where sales were happening. So we found that animated pins uh, would be a great representation of this, and they will, they will help us locate the viewer into a specific city. We wanted to give the pins a satisfying entrance animation. You probably saw it in the beginning. They basically just dropped into the globe as there were sales being, happening in those specific cities and we turned to React to Spring to make this happen. We were able to see really pop out the glob. We also made them clickable, so if a, a viewer wanted to just like click in a city instead of typing it up on the search bar, that was also possible. Okay. A very nice feature that we added that I also like a lot is the, um, the airplanes just flying around. Flying around. Airplanes were possible due to, due to the implementation of circular motion, which basically consisted of three steps. So, oh, I'm sorry, I think I went back too far. Okay, so the first one is to parent the airplane uh, to an empty object, which we use as the pivot point. The second one will be to offset the airplane by a given amount uh, that will correspond to the distance that it will have to travel to. Um, or by, and then the third one will be to rotate the pivot object uh, at each frame. The airplane that orbits around the equator, which is a method that works perfectly fine um, and is suitable for the small amount of airplanes that we wanted to put in. Uh, we could have definitely rendered tens of thousands of airplanes without a lot of effort, but we settled on a much reasonable dozen to make it a little bit more realistic. You don't really have a lot of, or ten of tens of thousands of planes doing, uh, flying at the same time, at least in this occasion. Okay. So now, uh, moving on to the glob, um, getting to the, find, the final idea of what we wanted for the glob was uh, a process that took some time. We all were imagining different things, and all of them were cool, at least to uh, each of our perspective. So uh, we played around with multiple textures and styles that we wanted to uh, implement until we finally came to the one that we adapted. So we decided to go with a, a style that mirrored the look of a risograph print. Rise of Grab uh, printing is a stencil duplicator, so just think about it like a cross between screen printing and photocopying. A key element of Rise of Grab prints um, is the noise that you get all over them. And I'm actually just going to go, well, I guess it's the same. Um, so it's the dots that are varying sizes that you see over them. Um, we initially tried to implement that as a screen space uh, effect using the React post-processing library, but it never felt quite right. It wasn't accomplishing what we wanted. 
So we wanted to make those little dots uh, look very sharp in all screens, and this was really key. And tried to, uh, we tried with a few different 2D and, and 3D noise functions, like the pearly noise, simplex noise, and whirly noise, which is also called cellular noise. We finally ended up going with PSDR noise, which allows you to create flow noise. Uh, this was, you know, uh, I guess when we, get, we got consensus of how we wanted it to look, this worked for us. So PSDR noise uh, is a variant of simplex noise uh, that tiles uh, into the entry D and that supports, um, well, I guess you can read this, <laughs> that supports, oh, I just got lost. Anyways, I'm reading from there. So first, an animation technique called Flow Noise in 3D. It's fairly new as was published in 2022, so we, will, I, you know, we rushed to actually use it. PSDR noise can be applied to iSphere without any modification, and it gives uh, noise with no seams, stretching, or distortion. OK, so 3APR noise uh, is, is wonderful, but it comes with a price. Obviously, uh, it is computational, very expensive especially when calling the PSDR noise function more than once per fragment to create flow noise. And that's exactly what we wanted to do. So in order for us to be able to, be, to, be use, to use this effect, but also be performant, we have to downgrade a little and just uh, use the cheaper version, which is the 2D PSDR noise function. OK, so I know that's really a lot to take in, and it's really fast as well. At the time, doesn't really allow to go more into implementation details. Um, I know you want to see code and all of these things, but the good news is that our spatial commerce team is putting together a blog post uh, to go more in detail with this, where you're going to be able to like interact with the code and then just see how would things have looked if you you know play with the values and so on and so forth. So you should be tuned for that one. It will be out, I believe, at the end of uh, September. And this will be just like a way to hype up people to uh, look for the BFCM glove that is coming in 224. OK, so this brings me to the third point of my presentation. And it is um, the things that we have to take into account when thinking of cross-platform. While it is true that the BFCM glove is a web-targeted product, we never stop thinking cross-platform. Given today's uh, diverse device ecosystem, it is crucial to think of performance on every and everything from high-end desktops to mobile uh, devices. One of the biggest challenges that we faced, for instance, uh, was the fact that in previous years, we were limited by the amount of arcs that we, uh, we, were, we were able to draw per frame. So rendering over 1,000 arcs, for instance, uh, would have bring some mobile devices to a crawl. But this time, we decided to tackle this problem um, and found a solution. The solution was using instancing. Um, which is a technique where multiple copies or instances of the same base mesh can be drawn at the same time in the GPU. So React Fiverr and 3JS support instances out of the box. Uh, so doing something like, you know, just wrapping your code in a, an instance mesh um, component will do it for you. Each instance can have its own unique properties, such as position and rotation, but they all share the same geometry and material, material data. This is because like, the arcs are always going to be arcs, the you know, uh, fireworks are always going to be fireworks, and so on, meaning in terms of geometry. This results in a single draw call. So the shared geometry also means that only the vertices of the base me mesh need to be uploaded to the GPU. We use instances to manage performance, especially for our arcs, since they were meant to be rendered multiple times because of each purchase being made, and there were many, thankfully. Without instances, instancing, each mesh requires a separate draw call, as the CPU must send individual data sets uh, to the GPU instead for each of them. So this increases the memory consumption, and obviously this will ultimately uh, impact performance. With this new method, we were able to render tens of thousands of arcs in a single draw call and solve our problem or potential issue in mobile devices. Another aspect that we were really meticulous about and we really cared about, especially when it come and came for uh, the, the glove being viewed from a mobile device, was styling. Um, we were really careful to add as many styles as they were necessary with the right properties, so the experience for our mobile viewers wasn't downgraded from that from our web viewers. Um, you can see that the globe leverages React.js, but with a strong focus on mobile platforms and obviously uh, the 3D libraries that we were using. 
We focus on several key aspects. We turn to our responsive design uh, principles like using flex grids, fluid images, and CSS within the context of uh, what we manage at Shopify. Um, so we can manage the layouts in the different uh, screen sizes. We also prioritize performance optimi optimization as animations and transitions, as you already probably know, can be very resource intensive. So leveraging hardware acceleration and optimizing CSS uh, definitely help us to maintain a smooth performance across devices. And finally, we paid a special attention to touch interactions as they were vital for mobile users. We rely, they obviously rely on touch gestures uh, rather than mouse inputs. So this was important for us. Uh, there were other things to consider, obviously, like uh, pixel density and screen resolution, and just ensuring that the assets were scalable and they look sharp in all of the devices. We also took that into account. Um, so React has definitely come a long way, along with React Native. We all know this. Today, we are just not building web apps. We are more and more creating immersive, interactive experiences across all platforms. Thanks to uh, libraries like Triv, uh, React with Fiverr and React Native in general. React has truly grown into an ecosystem where anything is possible, and then uh, the tools available today uh, for, uh, to us allow us to dream really big and then just create things that are even bigger to what we dream. We have seen it with all the talks today. You're definitely going to be able to experience and see more of that tomorrow. So I hope that sharing a little bit of our experience with building the BFCM Globe gives you the motivation to continue exploring the tools uh, that React and React Native have to offer. We definitely are lucky to live in this era uh, when it comes to web development and mobile development. The libraries and tools available to us mean that the only limit is really our imagination and the internet sometimes. Um, so whether you are working in a simple website or just an XR experience, uh, the React ecosystem has you definitely covered with, in a way that you can accomplish many things uh, with the knowledge that you currently have. And that's it for me. Thank you.